Hi, my name is Christina Heron, Government Relations Manager of Health Policy with the Heartland Institute. And today I have Justin Goodman as a special guest with White Coast Waste Project to talk a little bit about federal policy and some other healthcare issues. Hi, Justin. Thanks for coming on and talking with me today. Oh, it's great to be here again, Christina. Yeah, we had a really good conversation maybe a month and a half, two months ago. And I know that policy is moving and um, some good things are happening in Congress. So um, before we get into that, can you just give our listeners an overview of what White Coast Waste Project does, their mission, what they stand for? Of course. So White Coast Waste Project is a three million member taxpayer watchdog group. And specifically, we're interested in exposing, well, we like to use the acronym FED, finding, exposing, and defunding wasteful taxpayer funded animal experiments. A lot of people don't realize that the private sector, like cosmetics companies, for example, are not the biggest problem when it comes to animal testing. It's the federal government that wastes about $20 billion a year doing things like putting grizzly bears on treadmills, putting fish on treadmills, putting shrimp on treadmills. I don't know if you can hear my, my cat back there. Um, he, has, he has a lot to say about this topic. Uh, so just incredibly wasteful projects that people don't want to pay for. And in a lot of cases, they don't realize they're paying for. So what we do is we expose that to the public, bring that information to Congress, and then work in a bipartisan way to find common sense solutions to cutting waste, fraud, and abuse in the government. And we've been very fortunate to find support from Republicans, Democrats, independents, uh, both in the grassroots and in Capitol Hill uh, for these efforts to save taxpayer dollars and protect animals. It's a win-win for everyone. Yeah, I think that's so awesome. I think that one of the first times I kind of heard about, um, especially like the animal abuse and waste, and it was very bizarre studies that were being funded by the federal government was in Senator Paul's um, kind of festivist report grievances where he goes over, you know, a list of grievances he has against these federal agencies. And some of like the amounts of money that were going into these things were incredible. I know there was one um, just very bizarre studies. So I think it's really cool that you all, um, you know, are an official organization that's really tackling this issue, because I think it's um, just something that the general public probably doesn't know much about. I mean, there's so much waste in the federal government, but these really bizarre niche animal abuse studies with taxpayer dollars is just very strange to me. But yeah, so yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, Rand Paul is a great supporter of ours. We're, you know, really lucky to work with him. And we do work with him on the Festivus report that you mentioned. And actually the godfather of all of this, and I'll bring it up just because there's a memorial service for him this weekend, is Senator Tom Coburn. And back in the mid-2000s, he released a report with John McCain called Summertime Blues. And they exposed uh, an experiment. One of the experiments they exposed was monkeys hooked on cocaine. And that kind of became the uh, poster child for wasteful government spending at the time just happened to be it was related to animal experiments so that was what actually inspired our president and founder anthony bellotti my boss uh to start white coat waste he was working in republican politics and saw this nexus of issues he cared about animals uh he worked in an animal lab at one point and was so horrified by what he saw he thought one day i'm going to get back to this when he saw tom coburn's report he thought this is how you do it. You marry wasteful spending with animal protection and you have hopefully a winning recipe. And I think the last five years that I've been at White Coat, we've certainly seen that. Yeah, I just think that's so interesting. Um, and then I just want to hear what you all are working on with federal legislators. I know there's some policy, um, the ARF Act, like woof, woof, ARF, like yeah. a dog. <laughs> um, I think that's a very clever name good for messaging, but can you talk a little bit about that bill, co-sponsors, and you know what that legislation would do? Absolutely. So the ARF Act is the Alternatives to Animals for Regulatory Fairness Act, and this is a regulatory relief bill. Um, basically, the long and short of it is, is there's about 60,000 dogs used in experiments in the U.S. each year, and our estimate that is that because reporting is so terrible, we don't actually know an exact number, but our estimate is that one-third of all those dogs are being used to fulfill government mandates, mainly by the FDA for drug makers. So basically the FDA tells drug makers, if you want something to go into human trials, you're gonna have to use a lot of animals. It's gonna cost you many millions of dollars. It's gonna take years to do. It's not very accurate. It's gonna be wasteful, but you're gonna have to do it anyway. Right. Uh, and one of the ways they do that is by force feeding puppies who are as young as a week old 
uh, massive doses of experimental drugs to see what dose kills them, uh, injecting it into, under their skin, into their eyes, putting gas masks on their face and forcing them to breathe, aerosol drugs. Uh, and the FDA and the NIH admit that these drugs fail 95% of the time in humans because the animal tests don't predict what's going to happen in people. Right. So I think everyone cares about dogs. That's a given. But if you're also, con you know, if you're concerned with efficiency in the government and government waste and waste in the private sector, we have companies spending millions of dollars on just the animal tests, spending years to do them, right. investing billions in the drugs that those animal tests are supporting only to find out later on, oh yeah, those animal tests were actually, that the FDA made us do, misled us, and this wasn't something we should have proceeded with human trials with. So it's very misleading, incredibly wasteful, and companies push back on the FDA, and unfortunately the FDA acts like a mob boss and tells them do it or else. And right. you have companies that very reluctantly are paying to poison puppies uh, when there's better technology out there. A team from Hebrew University in Israel just submitted the first ever drug developed with absolutely no animal testing using high throughput technologies that are based on human biology and are faster, faster, more effective. And they developed this drug in way less time and at way lower cost uh, than they would have if they had to be forced to do animal testing. Now, the FDA may come back and force them to do animal testing still, but right. that'll be a high profile fight. So our bill, getting back to your question, our bill, the ARF Act, the Alternatives to Animals for Regulatory Fairness Act, simply says that if a drug company can fulfill and wants to fulfill regulatory requirements by using non-animal test methods, they should be allowed to, because the outdated laws right now from the 19, that date back to the 1930s say that you have to do animal tests and then human tests. There's no like middle ground. Um, so while the FDA says out of one side of its mouth, we will accept that alternative technologies when companies bring them to us. On the other hand, the law actually doesn't really allow for that in a clear way. So because of these unclear guidances and laws and rules, there's a lot of ambiguity in the regulated community and companies feel like they have to do things they don't want to do. And as a result, there's just a lot of waste, waste of dogs' lives, waste of money, waste of time, and patients are suffering all the while. Yeah, I think that's so interesting, too. I mean, you give us the date of the 1930s. I mean, wow, if you look how transformative medicine has been in the last 10 years, let alone, you know, 90 years, it's like, why are we sticking with these outdated, you know, FDA bureaucratic processes that are just so inefficient? And it doesn't I'm not I don't come from a science background. I'm, you know, more of an English and philosophy area of study. But I don't think it takes a genius to understand that, you know, you've got a golden doodle puppy and a human DNA and genome, it's not going to be the same output. So why not allow for these alternative method methods that use technology and, you know, very innovative ways to approve drugs faster for patients? Why would we not allow industry leaders who are going to be the best at their practice to make those decisions? To me, that is just like such a no brainer that we would not allow the industry leaders trying to you know, bring us the next COVID vaccine or what have you, you know, at these record, you know, paces, the ways we do that is, you know, roll back these regulations that just are inhibiting innovation. So to me, this just makes it just, you know, a common sense approach. And, um, you know, I really like that there's a bipartisan effort towards this, you know, movement of this deregulatory movement. But yeah. yeah. And, you know, our, the, our campaign name is cut FDA red tape for this campaign. So if people visit cut FDA red tape.org, you could contact Congress about the bill and learn a little more about this. But the example you mentioned, you know, something in a, a golden doodle is not going to perform the same way it's going to perform mm -hmm. in a person. And I like to give the, I like to give the example of chocolate because anyone who's ever been around a dog or knows, you know, had a dog knows that dogs die for do, dogs die from chocolate and humans die for chocolate. So that's, you know, it's nonsense to think that you're going to develop a drug to treat a human disease by putting into the wrong animal with a disease that you're artificially inducing in them that they wouldn't actually get. And our bill, the R fact doesn't ban animal testing. It just simply says if a company thinks that they can get a drug to market faster, more cheaply and more efficiently by using, by avoiding animal testing, that right. they should be allowed to do that. And I think, you know, you mentioned COVID, the COVID situation has been a perfect example of where that this, this is going to work because you had companies like Moderna and Pfizer that actually bypassed a lot of the animal testing that would have been required before they go into human trials. Now, the FDA still made 
them do a lot of animal testing after the human trial started. So they were kind of happening concurrently. But had they been forced to do the animal testing first, we're a year into the, you know, we're, we're 13 months into the pandemic, we still wouldn't have the drugs because right. we'd still be worrying about what was happening in monkeys and mice. Right. So it just, you know, I think a public health crisis like this underscores the urgency of reforming the, the FDA system right now to make sure that we're, that drug companies are allowed to use the best tools available. Yeah, I think just you hit the, you know, nail on the head there. It's just like, let companies use the best tools that are available and expediting approval for these drugs is so important. And obviously, we all want safe, effective drugs. But I don't think regulations from the 1930s are what we're going to be needing in 2021. And I think, obviously, everyone listening to this podcast or watching this video interview is probably a free market, you know, proponent. And we know that the free market gives us, you know, the most innovation because there is competition and we allow industry leaders to do what they do best. So I think kudos to you guys. This is awesome. Um, Yeah. Is there any other federal policy that y'all are working on? Yeah. So we're working also on a bill called the Cost Openness and Spending Transparency Act. And that was introduced in the Senate by uh, Joni Ernst from Iowa and in the House by Ralph Norman from South Carolina. And this is what we call our price tag bill. Basically, this bill would require anybody getting federal money through grants or contracts when they do a public statement or public release of some kind, press release, they have to include exactly, they have to mention that it was federally funded and include exactly how much they spent on it. And this allows, obviously, taxpayers and Congress to then hold agencies accountable for waste and abuse. When you see, uh, this is a true story. I mean, a week ago, there was a story in the New York Times about putting grizzly bears on treadmills. You know, that cost taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars, but you wouldn't know that. You'd think, oh, someone private funded this or you wouldn't know that. But when you realize, oh, yeah, this is a funny video we're watching, maybe sad, depending on what your perspective is. Right. Okay, this cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars that could have been spent on. I can list a hundred thousand other things that would be more useful than putting a grizzly bear on a treadmill. So this bill would require that you put price tags now. There, ha- there is a law that does this for some federal agencies that ex- that's existed since 1989, but it has no enforcement mechanism. So we find all over the place that federal grantees, particularly getting money from the NIH, are not disclosing how much they're spending. Uh, one particular institution we recently exposed for violating this law was the nonprofit that has been sending NIH money to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, where a lot of people believe the pandemic started as a result of NIH funded research. And had we fun- had we known that the NIH was funding dangerous coronavirus experiments in Wuhan, China through this nonprofit, had they disclosed it like they were supposed to by law, it probably would have raised some red, some red flags. And we just did a, uh, an op-ed in Newsweek with Joni Ernst explaining why the bill is so important. And, yeah. and you know, getting back to the FDA just for a moment as it relates to this bill, I mean, the FDA certainly, it does require a lot of animal testing of companies. It does its own as well. And it also uh, gives out grants. So we exposed a few years ago, the NIH was addicting monkeys to baby monkeys to nicotine. They'd spent five and a half million dollars on it. We got that shut down. Those monkeys are now living at a retirement facility in Florida, just like all my Jewish relatives from New York. <laughs> and uh, and the FDA is currently, they just ended funding for a grant. They were funding an eel company in Canada. They gave them over $300,000 to see if they put female hormones in the eel feed if eels would be fattened up quicker for the meat markets. That is so bizarre. I mean, yeah. that, it's just we're 20, I, want, I don't want to misspeak here, but 29 trillion something. We're, you know, high 20s in, you know, debt. And we have federal agencies, unelected bureaucrats making decisions of where this money is being spent. And it's so, it's just so fascinating to me that there isn't tr- more transparency in this. Yeah, and there, constituents and voters aren't demanding transparency in this. Well, the nice thing about all of these things, whether it's the R Act, whether it's the Cost Act, or anything we work on, not only do we have bipartisan support on the Hill. So, for example, the R Act was introduced by uh, Brendan Boyle, Democrat from Pennsylvania, Brian Fitzpatrick, Republican from Pennsylvania, and Madeline Dean, another uh, Democrat from Pennsylvania. Uh, Fred Keller from PA, Republican, is on that bill now. Uh, very bipartisan. Um, but the nice thing about all these things, including the Cost Act, which is a more straightforward transparency bill, you have something like I think our the polling we've commissioned shows seventy two percent of taxpayers, Republicans and Democrats alike, so super majority level, think yes, we should 
be able to see easily how much taxpayer money is being spent on these projects. And a similarly large number of people agree that if an institution is not abiding by the law to disclose their spending, they should lose their funding. Yeah, um, so, you know, these are great areas of bipartisan cooperation and agreement. And, you know, our perspective is, is that's where you're going to get the most done. So especially in a divisive time like this, we're very proud that we've been able to identify areas where there is bipartisan agreement and make progress. Yeah, I think that's so important, too. I think, um, you know, a lot of the national media and um, a lot of groups like to divide because that is how they conquer. But really, there is a lot of common ground on Capitol Hill or it could be found. Um, I think it could be found. And this is one way to do it, you know, looking at, you know, these types of issues and what's important to voters. And, you know, I've never met anyone who was uh, excuse me, I interrupted you. You're fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, I never met anyone who uh, didn't think drug prices were too high. Right. And I never met anyone who was happy about government waste. Yeah. So, you know, that's why the, these are nice issues, because no matter where, what state you're from or what congressional district or how you vote, these are things that are going to appeal to you and hopefully right. motivate you to call Congress and take action and visit cutfdaredtape.org and, you know, ask Congress to support the ARF Act um, or costact.org where you could take action on the other bill. Um, yeah, this is, this is one of the few areas where we are able to see that uh, bipartisan cooperation. Yeah, I think it's awesome. And, you know, from taking a free market approach to it, I think is phenomenal. So um, this is great. Is there any other legislation or work that you all are doing that our listeners, you know, might want to know about? Um, I think those are probably the two most important things we're working on legislatively right now. We're, we're very involved in, and this is kind of a, you know, a bit of a tangential issue, but we're very involved in the in, uh, trying to get investigations into the COVID origins and the lab leak and what role taxpayer funded research had in that. Um, because there's been a lot of uh, misinformation out there uh, and the, the possibility that this thing started in a NIH funded lab in Wuhan is very likely. Um, and we really need to get to the bottom of it. And as you might imagine, the unelected bureaucrats who paid for that don't want to talk about, you know, the what actually happened. So we're bet we're we're working with Congress on that as well. But our fact and cost act are right now our legislative priorities. Yeah, well, I love the tri or price transparency, and then I also love, you know, taking a free market approach to, you know, the regulatory burdens and you know, letting, not forcing the hand of industry leaders, but, you know, letting them choose the best route and then, you know, giving, um, you know, patients cheaper, you know, better quality drugs sooner. So that's awesome. Um, and then I know you mentioned your website, but if you just want to mention it one more time, so our viewers can um, visit that for, to stay up to date with the work that y'all are doing. Sure. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity for one last plug. Yeah. Uh, wh Whitecoatwaste.org is our website. And you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, White Coat Waste, um, and really social media is where we have the most updated information about all these campaigns and everything else we're working on. Awesome. Well, Justin, thank you so much for your time and for all the work that you are doing to, you know, protect taxpayer dollars. So we really appreciate it. Thanks for your support, Christina. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel and consider donating to the Heartland Institute to support more vibrant free markets greater individual liberties, and more videos like this one.